History as it happens, June 22nd, 2023, the Jeju Incident. One of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. Here, the Russian-dominated North Koreans launched a full-scale, well-prepared drive on the capital of the South. On South. Sunday, June 25th, the peaceful communist the forces country. attacked the Republic of Korea. Free nations must be on their guard, more than ever before, against this kind of sneak attack. The nation's troops push on in the cautious advance against the communists. The cost of repelling aggression has been high. In thousands of homes, it has been incalculable. In the earliest years of the Cold War, as the Korean Peninsula was divided, then embroiled in war, an orgy of killing liquidated villages on a small Korean island but it would be memory hold for decades. Today, few outsiders visiting Jeju realize their planes land on a runway paved over mass graves. But South Koreans know, and they want their U.S. allies to acknowledge their role more than 70 years ago in the Jeju incident. That's next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Our two nations signed the mutual defense treaty and open a new era of the alliance. Ever since, the Korean people rose from the ruins of war to build a thriving nation. And at every step, America has stood together with Korea. But what I would like to see, and I think this is something which America might consider doing, is perhaps create a museum, a research center of the Cold War, in which all these matters could be unraveled. If what happened on Jeju Island after the end of the Second World War, if any U.S. role in the suppression of an uprising by left-wing rebels that led to massacres of civilians, if this was on South Korean President Yoon's mind when he addressed Congress in late April, he didn't mention it. Instead, he hailed the U.S.-South Korea alliance, now in its 70th year. We have many reasons to celebrate our platinum anniversary. We had no guarantees of success when it started. But today, our alliance is stronger than ever, more prosperous together, and more connected like no other. For decades, most Koreans did not speak about what happened on Jeju Island. On March 1, 1947, police shot into a crowd at an independence demonstration, killing six civilians. And at the time, most Americans couldn't find Jeju on a map, this smallish island about 80 miles off the southern coast of the Korean peninsula. But 1947 was the year President Harry Truman announced his doctrine to contain communism. The primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States. In a speech to Congress requesting aid for Greece and Turkey so those two countries wouldn't go communist, leading to a red spread elsewhere. To ensure the peaceful development of nations, free from coercion, the United States has taken a leading part in establishing the United Nations. The United Nations is designed to make possible lasting freedom and independence for all its members. We shall not realize our objectives, however, unless we are willing to help free peoples to maintain their free institutions and their national integrity against aggressive movements that seek to impose upon them totalitarian regimes. Well, what's true today was true then. All communists weren't the same, and all of them weren't taking their orders from Moscow. Washington Times Asia Bureau Chief Andrew Salmon writes that on April 3, 1948, communist guerrillas opposed to elections that would divide Korea between opposing blocs storm police posts across Jeju. A paramilitary of fanatically anti-communist North Koreans and other mainland reinforcements arrived to support local forces, and a red hunt began. At least 14,000 people would be killed, mostly in 1948 and 49. But fighting continued through the Korean War after it began in 1950. Some estimates placed the death toll at 30,000. When the uprising began in 1948, the U.S. military retained command of Korean forces as the autocratic government of Sigmund Rhee took power in Seoul. 
As Jeju Governor Oh Young Hoon told Andrew Salmon at a recent forum on the Jeju incident, it happened during the U.S. military government. This is not something we can neglect, he said. The U.S. should take measures to be more accountable for their responsibility for this tragic incident. Andrew Salmon, hello from the other side of the world. Hey, Martin. Hello. How are you? So my older brother often says the best music is music that surprises. I often say the same about history. And what I mean by that is surprises me, new to me. I'm always learning about some chapter of the past that I knew nothing about. And I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I'm reading the Washington Times. And there I see an article written by one Andrew Salmon about the Jeju, yeah, the Jeju massacre, the Jeju uprising on Jeju Island. Mm -hmm. So why is this bubbling up now uh, in South Korean politics? Is it bubbling up now? Or did I just write the story now? This has been <laughs> bubbling up basically since, should we say, Korean democratization, which was way back in, in 1987. Or you could say it's been bubbling since 2003, when after sort of years of research and discussion, the, uh, the then South Korean president made a public apology. Or you could say it's just been bubbling up in, in very, very recent years when Jeju has sort of returned as a major South Korean tourist destination. And there are some major activities on Jeju which are designed to, to bring this very, very dark past history back to light. There are now dark tours of what happened in 1948-1949. There's a very, very somber memorial museum in the centre of the island, and, and there's a whole range of monuments to what happened now springing up everywhere. So tourists who visit Jeju 10 years ago might have legitimately known absolutely nothing about what happened on this island well within living memory. Um, that's no longer the case. It's being very, very well memorialized. And I think it's coming into the public gaze more so than simply into the gaze of those who follow Cold War history or um, post-Cold War politics. Now, the runway was paved, the airport on Jeju Island, the runway was paved over a mass grave. We'll return to that in a moment. And your article was about how South Koreans, ordinary people, their politicians want the United States to fess up to its complicity in what happened back in the uh, late 1940s. I mean, is that going anywhere? That remains to be seen. Let's put this into a much wider context. This is post-World War II. Asia is in considerable turmoil. There are pro-independence movements in various parts of the region. There are communist movements in parts of the region. There are anti-communist movements. The end of the war unleashes a whole range of different furies, including on um, on Jeju Island, which is south of South Korea. That's right. Um, People should, uh, while listening to us, go to Google Maps on your phone or whatever and just find where this island is so you have an idea of what we're talking about here. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Japanese colonization after 35 years comes to an end. Exactly. I mean, so for most Westerners back in sort of the 40s and the 50s, they'd never heard of a country called Korea for good reason. This was before the days of, of mass tourism. It's before the days of mass communication. And of course, in 1910, Japan had colonized this peninsula, which we call Korea, and it had essentially disappeared from the global mind map until 1945. And so in 1945, and very much as an afterthought in the closing months of World War II, the Allied powers are wondering, what do we do with, with these Japanese colonies? And, you know, given that we're speaking in the, uh, the midst of an extremely nasty hot war in Ukraine, it's worth pointing out something to your, uh, to your listeners. The Korean Peninsula and Manchuria, they roughly correspond in Asian geopolitics and strategic geography to Poland and Belarus and Ukraine in Western geography in the sense that this has always been for many centuries the places where empires collide and where really, really grim, bloody events take place. And so if we think about it in that sense, then that gives you a, sort of a broader idea. This is where the Japanese empire was expanding. This is where the Russian empire 
met the Pacific. It's where the Chinese empire was sort of eroding and degrading and where a new struggle, the, the, the Cold War between American democracy and capitalism and Soviet stroke Chinese communism was shaping up. So this is the arena we're, we're talking about. And the post-colonial world starts coming into view in 1945. Before we return to the history here, Jeju Island today is considered the Hawaii of Korea, right? It's a very yeah, popular tourist spot, honeymooners, etc. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's one of the chillest places in Northeast Asia. About 700 square miles. It's a volcanic black lava island with some good beaches. I wouldn't compare it to Bali or Hawaii, but it's got this absolutely stunning, gorgeous interior, the sort of mountainous, wild, rocky, volcanic terrain, which reminds me, actually, of the um, the highlands of Scotland in some way. Now, you've been to Jeju Island on reporting trips, so... I've been down there several times, actually. I mean, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago saying, could Jeju be Asia's next island in the sense that, you know, we've had... Tuman, we've had Koh Samui, we've had Bali, you know, could Cheju be the next thing? I mean, it, it's actually super cool now. A lot of very laid back young people opening surf shops, pensions, you know, family run hotels, restaurants, coffee shops. It, it's got this laid back vibe. But um, like Bali, which had an extraordinarily bloody history, like Okinawa uh, nearby, which suffered an extraordinary uh, bloody harrowing in the last months of World War II, Cheju, that the ghosts are roaming, that this is an island of blood and fire. Let's get into that now. So World War II is over. The U.S. military occupies the southern portion of Korea, the Soviet Union, the north. As we mentioned, it ends 35 years of Japanese colonization. What were Korean national aspirations at this point? There were divisions, right, among Koreans, competing visions of what the future should be. Some wanted communism. The United States certainly did not want communism there. You're looking at a cauldron of of different views, perspectives, and players. There was no single Korean polity at the uh, the end of World War II, the the nation had been dismantled by the Japanese colonists. But there were a whole range of players from the the communists who had actually fought in Manchuria to the Korean provisional government, which had operated arguably with so little success in Shanghai. And of course, then you had all the 18, 19, 20 million Koreans who had stayed at home during the colonial period. Some had resisted, many had not. So once the, the lid of colonialism is lifted. You have this seething mass of different political beliefs and aspirations and a whole range of players from hardcore communists like Kim Il-sung, who subsequently becomes the the leader of North Korea, to Ri Sing Man, who is this American-based Korean academic and elite. Uh, He was educated at Harvard, at Princeton. He had sat out World War II as a lobbyist in the United States. And he's the man that the Americans bring in to, to essentially become the president of Korea when it becomes sadly and tragically clear that there can be no agreement between the East and the West, or rather the um, the USSR and, and the USA on how the trusteeship for Korea is going to work. So not only do you have two competing macro powers, you've got multiple competing micro powers for all these different Korean political groups, some of them communists with a hard C, some of them communists with a small C, some of them massively anti-communists, some of them former collaborators with the Japanese. You've got this whole vibrant and potentially very violent stew of politics going on around Korea at at this time. Yeah, like most history, it is complicated. So I found an article about Jeju's history at inkstickmedia.com, of all places. Uh, In the 1940s, just to add some more context here, Jeju was a largely agrarian society comprised of overwhelmingly independent farmers who grew barley, buckwheat, citrus, and other crops. Immediately after the war, Jeju's population swelled by roughly 25% as conscripted soldiers, newly liberated laborers who had been forced to work in Japan, and others returned. Rising unemployment, inflation, and a cholera outbreak led to heightened social tensions. So, as you wrote in your article for the Washington Times, the U.S. Army military government in Korea, USMJIC, I guess is the acronym there, 
Yeah. yeah, they're in charge militarily, but a domestic government takes over in Seoul. Not until August 1948. 48, so yeah. what we're going to talk about in a moment, the early months of it actually take place under U.S. Army military governance. And that's critical to understand. Sigmund Rhee, that's a name I think a lot of people remember. I think he's mentioned in Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, but I might be wrong about is he? that. Um, I haven't listened to that song for yeah. years. You know, he takes power in the south. Weeks later, Kim Il-sung takes power in the north. So we, we see two competing regimes. Many in Korea, and I'm talking South Korea, were very, very much against this development. They saw that this sowed the seeds for future war. And of course, they, they weren't wrong. But Ri, one of the mistakes he makes, but arguably it was a mistake, he couldn't have done anything else, is forced, because he's, a, he's an anti-communist, to take on board former police and troops who had actually served with and for Imperial Japan. Oh, wow. Okay. And not going to be welcomed by those, particularly those who are left-leaning in various parts of the South. Yeah. And in Korea, the Southwest has traditionally been sort of an anti-Seoul, left-leaning part of the country. And that's, I think it's probably fair to say, Cheju in 1947, 1948 was also somewhat left-leaning. There was something called the People's Committee and other left-wing groups. This is lowercase c, communism. Something else is going on here, again, before we drill down to what's going to happen on Jeju. The Truman Doctrine is pronounced in 1947, and the United States did not want Jeju to become what was called a Red Island. So tensions on Jeju are mounting because an election is announced and uh, it's not going to take place in North Korea, right? Because communists won't let the UN in. And on Jeju Island, people there did not want to see Korea become divided between these two different blocks. What we're talking about, what is known as the Jeju incident, which we're still working up to, yeah. it is in April 1948. But a year earlier, in 1947, there had been a demonstration in Jeju City in which a number of demonstrators who were commemorating an anti-Japanese independent movement back in, in 1919 were shot dead by police. Again, when we talk about the police in these days, we're talking about some fairly brutal characters these are the kind of guys who'd come up under colonial rule. You know, their activities were, even by the standards of pre-modern Korea, which is not the same as this very cool, sophisticated, fully democratic career of today, even by those different standards back in the day, they were behaving with extraordinary harshness. March 1st, and, um, 1947, this, Jeju police correct, shoot into a correct. crowd, six civilians are killed, and the police correct. are basically not punished, right? This sets the stage for the brutality that is then to come. Uh, local groups like the Jeju Islands People's Committee and other civilian groups sought independence, liberty, the preservation of a unified Korean peninsula, and the removal of any vestiges of Japanese colonial rule. So you have these police forces, as you mentioned, they are backed by the United States. Uh, yeah. And what we do know from more recent research is that the U.S. Army military government in Seoul was not actually happy with some of the personnel who were promoted in or deployed to Jeju-do. So certainly America was controlling the Korean polity at this time. This is just before the Korean state comes into power in August 1948. But even then, it's fair to say America didn't have full purview and control. They were in the process of handing over control to this new South Korean administration. And we're not, not entirely happy with some of the, um, the people who are actually uh, on the ground in Jeju. So there's the crackdown on left-wing activities. We talked about the March yeah. 1st, 1947 shooting at the independence demonstration, six people killed. So the Jeju incident or uprising, the date that comes to mind, and this is mentioned in Korea today, 4-3, right. April 3rd, 1948. What happens? And this is one of many, many problems. This is part of the fog of war or the fog of atrocity over Jeju. This is what Koreans call the Jeju incident. They call it 4-3 or Sasam, an Asian or Korean methodology in which something is named after its state. And of course, for those of us outside the region, we're not familiar with it. I mean, it tells us nothing. So one of the issues is that this situation, whatever we're going to call it, 
demands a rebrand that you know compresses more data into what happened. But let's talk about the day which is when Carthage essentially comes to Chejido. The 4-3 movement is actually a concerted uprising, a communist uprising led by a fairly hardcore communist guy called Kim Dalsam, who was a car-carrying member of the then Korean Labour Party and who, who had been um, one of the founding members, I think, of the party. And what we see is a coordinated time on target guerrilla rising against the police posts around Jeju Island. This rings alarm bells for everybody in Seoul, be they racing man's rising forces, but also, of course, the Americans who still control South Korea, what will become South Korea, rather, yeah. as a nation. So a couple dozen, that, right? A couple dozen police precincts were attacked. And this, you know, this was a coordinated attack. It took planning, it took personnel, it took arming and so on. So this was, this was the so-called Jeju uprising. So the government in Seoul then reacts to this. They send in government forces, paramilitaries that show up in Jeju to put down this uprising. It bleeds over from, you know, just going after the guerrillas. It spills over to killing civilians. There are massacres. There's displacement. So talk a little bit about what transpires after 4-3. Well, let's, let's, let's wind it back a little bit if we could. I mean, firstly, yes, different units from the mainland deploy to Jeju. But then we see uprisings and mutinies in the southwest of mainland South Korea as well, which, again, adds further fuel to the fire. So, again, if you're looking at this from a, a macro perspective, you're starting to see, oh, my God, we've got an uprising on Jeju, and it's spreading to Yosu and Sunchon, actually on the mainland. So one starts to understand why, and this is not excusing it, but why such a, a heavy hammer is lifted and subsequently lands squarely on Jeju. It becomes clear that some of the police forces, some of the, the so-called constabulary which, which later become the South Korean army, are not loyal to Seoul. And they sympathize with the various leftist movements, which are, are making a range of not unreasonable demands on their government. And of course, that government at this time, again, is the US Army military government in Seoul. And what happens in Jeju is of the various forces which are deployed to Jeju to suppress this uprising is a group called the Northwest Youth Group. These are Koreans from the northwest of the country, which is now becoming North Korea. Remember, the 38th parallel is already the dividing line, even though it's not a demilitarized zone at this stage. They have fled from communism. They are fanatically anti-communist. Uh, many of them are hardcore Christians. They want to have no truck with communism. And these are the groups who will tragically commit some of the worst atrocities in Jeju. I mentioned there's an election scheduled for later in 1948 that the people in Jeju, yeah. among others, were opposed to because they did not want to see the Korean Peninsula divided. Sigmund Rhee in late 48 was told that U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson wanted the guerrillas in Korea to be swiftly eliminated and that American support will require a robust response, meaning the Koreans had to put together a robust response and crush the uprising. Ordinary people, civilians, are displaced, they're massacred. Early in the uprising, there were actually discussions between the, the head of the Jeju Constabulary and, and the head of the communists. And these discussions were, were making some headway. There was the possibility of a ceasefire, and for reasons which, again, are not entirely clear to this day. This is disputed among historians. Those negotiations fell apart, and this is when a very, very harsh series of measures are implemented in Jeju. And however harshly one may feel against communism, I think it's fair to say that what happens in Jeju-do is wildly and horrifically disproportionate. So the strategy that is set in place is the interior of the island, this mountainous interior, which is perfectly designed for guerrilla warfare, is to be completely depopulated. All the villages there are to be burned down, destroyed. Their inhabitants are moved into a coastal strip around the, uh, the island's perimeter. This is essentially turning the island's interior into a free fire zone. This is scorched earth. 
And so the civilians are driven from their homes, their villages are put to the torch. And of course, during the what government forces call the Red Hunt, and of course, as we know, in every counterinsurgency war, when the enemy doesn't wear a uniform, bad things happen to the civilian population and and, and very, very bad things happen to those in Chejudo. Old people, children, women, when fleeing, are hunted down themselves, that they're, they're seen as being supportive of the guerrillas. Many of the men folk who may well be entirely innocent are taken away on trumped up charges. They're believed to be supportive of the guerrillas, and many of them sadly are shot after impromptu courts. A concentration camp, a de facto concentration camp, is set up in a disused distillery to sort of filter those who are being deported from the countryside into this coastal so-called cleansed zone. And again, shootings take place there. Bodies are hurled into, into a cave. And many of the old villagers will have you know, memories of hiding out in these sort of lava caves which honeycomb the interior of Chejudo as they see their villages burn, they're forced to hide in these places. There are snakes deep in these in these tunnels and so on. And women and children are hiding down there. This is a tableau of horror. So these groups of police, paramilitaries, army that are in Jeju, are they committing these massacres on their own initiative or do they just simply have the understanding that this is what Seoul wants? Again, this is one of the gray areas. It's not entirely clear. Let me be frank, the very worst of these atrocities are taking place under the Ri Singman administration when South Korea is founded as a, a nation state mm-hmm. on 1948. 1948. So at this point, America may say, this is no longer our problem. This bad stuff happened. This was Korean upon Korean. There's some justice, perhaps, to that view. What I learned recently, and I didn't know prior, is that even after August the 15th, 1948, which is South Korea's National Foundation Day, the US military for a year retained OPCON, operational control of South Korean forces. So this essentially is the big question, the one that historians need to uncover more evidence. And that is, how far was America aware of what was going on in Jeju's interior, and indeed, were these were these terrible things taking place under direct U.S. command, or did American commanders simply give a broad strategy, and the the terrible things which happened were done without their knowledge? These things are unclear yeah. to me, but legalistically speaking, I think there is a demand for some kind of investigation by American authorities because this was happening first under American governance, latterly under American OPCOM. January 17th, 1949, there's a village called Bukchon, B-U-K-C-H-O-N, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. You've been there. uh, You've interviewed survivors of what happened that day. This was one of, if not the worst massacre of this incident. Okay, so Bukchon is, if you visit there today, it's a modern village on the seashore. So it's within the five kilometer wide cleansed zone, so to speak. A patrol of, if I recall correctly, constables, possibly soldiers, were fired on from within the village. And the next day, they return in force. The village is cordoned off. The soldiers go in. People, including children, are dragged out of the elementary school. I spoke to one survivor who was an elementary school girl at the time. And then the shootings begin, the burnings begin. She has as one can imagine, a kaleidoscope of memories. She says um, they were dragged out before the shooting started. Her little tiny brother, I think he was just a a few months old, started yelling and a soldier came and clubbed him over the head. Everybody went silent. And then the shooting began. She says she recalls crawling through dead bodies. She saw an elderly neighbour sitting in the, the front door of her cottage. The thatch was burning as the soldiers or the paramilitaries fired the house. This woman was just seeing her with her her hair on fire. So this village essentially is liquidated. If you visit it now, there's a very moving memorial. They have coffin-shaped black stones to commemorate the villages who who were slaughtered that day. And some of them are very tiny because these commemorate the children who were killed in, again, this wildly disproportionate response to a firing from a village. 
Most of the killing takes place in 48-49, but fighting continues on into the Korean War, which breaks out in 1950. And because of the outbreak of the Korean War, this incident, these massacres, are memory hold. Certainly not for the people who experienced them and survived, right? But the Korean nation, if you will, no one talks about this for decades. Exactly. Well, I mean, again, we've got to remember... Korea, after the Korean War, is ruled by Rhee Sing Man until 1961. He's forced to flee to another island paradise, Hawaii, in 1961, after his troops shoot down protesting students in Seoul. Rhee will pass away there. He he doesn't return to Korea. He's essentially replaced by a military strongman, Park Chung-hee, who had served in the Japanese military during World War II, had worked with the American military during the Korean War, was a general, and he controls Korea until 1979. This is the authoritarian strongman who suppresses democracy but builds the economy. He creates the Korean economic miracle. He's a very mixed legacy. And then he's succeeded in 1989 by yet another general, Chun Doo Won. And it's only in 1987, after mass people power protests, that Korea gains full one man, one vote democracy. Well, these so strong is, men rulers were all anti-communist. I mean, that was the most important thing. Yeah. You know, From the perspective people, of the United States, that's what matters. But of course, there was a very, very serious communist threat during most of their rule. Let's remember that North Korea had started the Korean War by invading South Korea in June 1950. They had tried to assassinate the South Korean president in 1968 with a spectacularly bloody commando raid. There have been a whole range of special forces operations along the DMZ and down into the coast in the early 70s. You know, I could go on and on and on. So there really was a communist threat. And again, it's not until 68, 69, 70 that this new South Korean economy gets rolling, that the South Koreans bypass the North Koreans on the economic front. So, you know, one can understand why these guys were anti-communist. But course. again, like so many of the regimes which which were supported by the United States and the, the free world during the Cold War, I'm talking about Franco's Spain, a fascist regime. Pinochet's Chile, again, an extremely brutal regime. The regimes in South Korea and many others around the world. This was a harsh, tough nasty fight against communism. And and sadly, but, you know, this is the brutal reality. Many of the regimes which were on the front line, particularly Korea and South Vietnam, were not run by genteel Democrats. So the silence breaks in the late 80s. As you mentioned, Korea finally gets democracy, one person, one vote. And as I started the podcast, started the interview, it bubbles up Uh, as far as getting the U.S. to account for its role in all of this. Have you spoken to anyone in the Biden administration about what it might be interested in doing, apologizing, appointing an independent commission to investigate the history here? I haven't. I I did speak to the American ambassador um, just before I wrote that story. He was attending the Jeju Forum. He's a representative of the administration. so He is. He is. And and to be honest, he didn't appear at the forum session, which was covering what happened in Jeju in 1948-49, which I should add was far and away the best attended session of the Jeju Forum. You're talking... A three-day forum with all kinds of issues. Um, So this is very front of mind now then. Well, I mean, this lecture hall was literally jam-packed with, I'd say, a couple of hundred predominantly old Jeju Island. It was was so full that translation devices ran out. The U.S. ambassador, perhaps it was a smart move, did not attend that particular session. He did attend a later session, which was about the U.S.-Korea alliance, which is celebrating its 70th anniversary this year. And it's been a tremendously successful alliance. But of course, being a diplomat, he didn't mention anything about America's role in Jeju in 48, 49. So you know, as a journalist, I just grabbed him as he was leaving. And he, he very kindly did speak to me briefly. I think he said, it's very, very tragic what happened, the loss of life. That's all I have to say at this moment. Now, that tells me that, of course, Americans know this. They're familiar with the situation. They don't yet have a stance on or an official line. Because the ultimate question here is, 
Could the U.S. military, which had, as we've been discussing, a very significant presence in South Korea, done anything to stop the bloodshed or prevent it from even beginning? Those are difficult questions. These are difficult questions. And frankly, I'm not qualified to answer this. I'm a historian by by education, but I'm a journalist by trade. and I literally haven't done the kind of archival research that will be essential to answer that question. It's unclear to me that any real historians have done the work here either. I'm not. Uh, I could could be wrong about that. I mean, how many books have been written about this? I've got about five or six sort of leaflets and brochures, which were, you know, very kindly given to me by by people in Jeju-do, the great Korean War and Korean historian, one of America's leading historians of Korea, Bruce Cummings. Uh, he wrote quite extensively about it in his his two volume work, The Origins of the Korean War, in the early eighties. I think that sort of opened the door for Americans. In in the years since, a lot of his research has been disputed by other historians. Okay. Um, the book I would say, which is written by a, a former U.S. Army officer, has written a series of books. His two most recent books are very, very good. The first of those two volumes, which is Korea, A House on Fire, is by the the, the very noted military historian Alan Millett. And he, he uses the word Carthaginian for what happened to Jeju. Okay. And that's coming from a US, a retired US military officer and a, a respected historian. So I think whether you're left or right, one will agree that you know, very, very bad things happen there. But the question of responsibility, that is still an open book. So final question for you, Andrew Salmon. You mentioned before how the U.S. and South Korea are marking the 70th anniversary of the alliance and how it's important for them to show unity in the face of the challenge from China. So I'm wondering if the history of Jeju has the potential to be an irritant in their relationship. Well, one might say that in any relationship, be it between husband and wife, or be it between capital and capital, there should be a full accounting, there should be openness and honesty. And that, that's why I think it it arguably behooves America to look back on its actions during the Cold War. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not a communist. Uh, America won the Cold War, communism collapsed in Europe. And I think it's fair to say that South Korea has benefited massively from existing under the American security aegis. It benefited from the American-led sort of global free trade system in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. I think it's fair to say uh, has taken on, should we say, democratic liberal values. The South Korean of today is a man or a woman who has pretty much the same beliefs and behaviors and social mores and and aspirations as anyone in North America or Western Europe. South Korea is now one of the leading, most successful nations in the world. And that happened despite and because of all these bad things, but it happened also because of and thanks to American support. So, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not critiquing America. But what I would like to see, and I think this is something which America might consider doing, is perhaps create a museum, a research center of the Cold War in which all these matters could be unraveled. They could be unraveled strategically, politically, tactically, economically, morally, judicially. Was the end result, which is the arguably winning the Cold War, worth you know, the bad things which did happen under American-supported regimes around the world? That's an important question. I know what my answer would be, but I think many other people might disagree. But if democracy is about anything, it's about openness, it's about accountability, and it's about freedom of expression. The relationship between the U.S. and South Korea is strong enough to withstand some soul-searching, some introspection about this matter. I would say absolutely. Right now, we've got a, a conservative government in power here in Korea. They're doing in many ways, great things to generate more trilateral cooperation against China and against North Korea. And let's let's not beat around the bush. Probably the most totalitarian society in the world today is North Korea, a third generation post-communist neo-monarchy, which I think has ground much of the human spirit to powder. In that sense, South Korea is a shining beacon of democracy and freedom. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't look back onto the uh, the errors, the mistakes, and the horrors of the past 
and acknowledge what happened. Korea is a small country, thousands of miles away. But what is happening there is important to every American. On Sunday, June 25th, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. Free nations must be on their guard more than ever before against this kind of sneak attack. We are united in detesting communist slavery. We know that the cost of freedom is high, but we are determined to preserve our freedom no matter what the cost. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to stick with our recent theme of talking about history on television. There's a new Nat Geo TV series streaming on Hulu. It's called A Small Light. It's about the family that tried to hide Anne Frank and her family in Amsterdam during the Second World War, during the Holocaust. We're going to speak to people who knew Otto Frank and Meep Gies, the Dutch woman who tried to hide the Franks. As we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 